you put me on the spot. What does HIPAA stand for? Uh, Health Information Protection and Portability Act. What does portability mean? Portability means uh, the exchange of information. All right. Looks like we are rolling right into another episode of the Nameless Recovery Show. Today, my esteemed colleague, <laughs> my famed, heralded, revered, and feared guest, none other than interventionist Billy Gregg. Yay. Hi, Billy. Hi, Estel. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So you're an interventionist. Yes, sir. So you work with drug addicts all the time. Um, actually, I work with their families all the time. You work with a lot of families. Um, the reality of intervention is that a 80 to 90 percent of that is all family work. I don't interface with the addict a whole lot. I don't even get to meet them until I've already spent 30 to 40 hours preparing the family. Um, that might be a little bit over the mark, but um, if I have the time to really spend with a family to prepare them, then there's quite a bit of time brought up. But I don't, I don't even get to meet them until the day of um, the intervention. And my first real time with them is on the drive or on the flight to treatment. Um, and sometimes they just pull their hoodie over the head and close <laughs> it up and cross their arms and pretend like they're doing, they're not there. Sometimes. They become very agreeable. Um, I call it the special sauce of the intervention um, when I'm sharing it with families because I get to see a part that they never see. Right. And it's the first taste of what's treatment like? What do I have to expect? If they've never been to treatment before, that's my favorite one because um, they're terrified. And I'm, check I'm checking in with them like, how's your anxiety level? One out of ten. Uh, it's about a seven or an eight. Okay, let's let's you know let's do some deep breathing. Let's talk about something else. Uh, let me tell you about the amazing people you're going to meet in treatment. The first five seconds you're going to look at them and go, I don't like these people. And about four days later, you're going to go, I'm finally home. You're gonna you're gonna make some of the best friends you've ever made. Um, so, uh, I wish I had been intervened on. It sounds magical. <laughs> so not magical. Well, you didn't need an intervention, apparently, because you're, you know... The, yeah, the apparently. Yeah, I, I was... I got sober in Durango Jail. That's an intervention. I guess. Yeah. Um, I was definitely separated from drugs and alcohol against my will. The, um, <laughs> the families who need a professional to step in is because they're stuck in a cycle. Um, now, that professional stepping in sometimes is, you know, the penal system. Mm -hmm. stepping in and going okay you're off the streets because you're a danger um, and then families will have this great idea well if they go to treatment maybe they can avoid jail time mm -hmm. so um, suddenly they're not worried about their kid going to treatment they'd rather go to treatment than jail um, but prior to that they're like oh, none of my kids need to go to treatment um, as uh, the great John Southworth used to say uh, he called it the three L's, legal, liver, lover. One of those things is going to come into your world and screw things up royally, <laughs> and you're going to have to look at your using. That's pretty good. Um, and he was right, you know, in, in lover being loved ones, and um, so uh, my attempt to tackle the dynamics of the family to figure out you know, where's the kid getting money from? Who's making up the excuses? Who covers for him? Who tells their secrets to him? You know, how does he have power over this family? And dismantle that power matrix um, so that they're no longer monkeys in their circus, uh, in the attic circus. Um, and that's a, that's a humbling phrase when families are going bonkers, and I'm like, that's because you're a monkey in his circus. And I literally will say that. And they're like, I don't want to be a monkey anymore. Um, but we wield, you know, we addicts wield fam uh, power over our family with. Well, and that's, if I can interrupt you, that's probably yeah. a, one of the big paradigm shifts is when you're working with a family and helping them take the red pill to understand, like, Dude, you've been a huge contributing factor to this for a yep. long time. That's um, probably hard. That's probably hard to see at first. For the family to see. If I'm doing my job well, 
I don't have to be the one that brings it out. I've coaxed that truth out of other family members to come to the table and admit their fault and confront their loved ones in the things that they haven't been doing or have been doing that's been assisting the addiction. So I come, I come from a, um, the, my family day is usually two parts. First, if in, in order to understand what an intervention, how an intervention works, well, excuse me, in order to understand why they work, you have to understand addiction. Addiction, at the end of the day, causes us to be binary thinkers. We're avoiding pain and seeking pleasure. Everything comes secondary to that. Interventions are very uncomfortable situations. And if I can Fuck create yeah. if I can create enough discomfort, <laughs> then their response to seek relief, to seek pleasure, and really at the end of addiction, we're not seeking pleasure. No. We're seeking relief. Their rel relief, hopefully, because I'm stacking the deck, is to say yes to treatment. Um, so you're not a comforter, you're a discomforter. As my, as uh, <laughs> I think it's an old uh, Erickson quote, but um, my friend Pat Medford used to say it all the time, we're here to comfort the disturb and disturb the comfortable. Um, so the addict is very comfortable, they get all the power. Um, the family is very uncomfortable. So in order to Watching change that. Watching loved one die. Yeah. Right in um, front of them. And doing all they can to prevent that when in reality their preventative measures are what's fueling the tank farther down the road. So, um, but every family is a little bit different. Um, whatever that matrix is, if they can understand the very simple pl pain, pleasure, dynamic, then they really can understand why the letter is so important. So the letters go down this cascading trail, this, this journey from the past to the present. When, uh, happier times, good times, connection, love, experiences, and then what addiction has taken from them and where addiction has taken them now, um, hopefully is creating that discomfort. It's already there. I'm just mining it. I'm taking an opportunity sure. to mine that discomfort that's already there. Um, so, uh, the the hard part usually isn't. I mean, sometimes I'll say to families, I could get my daughter to convince your loved one to go to treatment on the right day. I said, getting them there is not really the biggest issue the biggest metric of intervention is has the family made a commitment to change their behaviors somebody watching this so i know exactly what you mean when you're talking about making a commitment to changing behaviors yeah. but just for the benefit of anybody who might be watching this that doesn't understand how how addiction engulfs the life of the sufferer or is maybe involved in that and isn't seeing what you're talking about right off the bat can you explain the commitment to changing the... F if I'm a family member, we're talking about my right. kid. It sounds ab abstract, so what's yes, the concrete thing? What's, what's, what's the commitment that I have to make? I'm, 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 I'm ready to do this, help my kid get sober. He's right. the one that's got to do the work, right? He's the one that's all fucked up. What, what's my commitment? It's different for every person depending upon the type of role they play in their family. Like, the enabler has to learn how to embrace their discomfort scary. because the primary enabler is the most selfish in the group almost more selfish than the addict themselves. They are not ultimately, at the end of the day, they're not trying to save their addict, they're trying to save themselves from the anxiety that they can't endure and they have no tools for on their own. So by saving the addict, they're relieving themselves of their anxiety. At the end of the day, it's, it's selfish, it's self-centered. It's not about them, it's about me. And they're acting out that anxiety is pushing their addict further down into their addiction. Yes, their addict just happens to be the perfect target for that emotion. Yeah. For that yeah. behavior. Well, because the addiction also increases anxiety. Yeah. Um, families who's, who, you know, it goes along the lines of um, identified patient syndrome. Our family would be just great 
if Esto could get his shit together, right? I'm the um, identified patient. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of the things I introduced to the family is you're all the patient. This isn't an Estel problem. This isn't a Johnny problem. This isn't a Cindy problem. This is a family problem. Yep. And your son or daughter is the fever to the family's cold. You might get rid of the fever, but you still have a cold. Just because they go to treatment doesn't mean that we don't have a lot to work on. And, um, as an interventionist, it's really a fun place because what my job is is to really coach and push them down the field. Um, I'm standing on the sidelines. I'm not the therapist to do the therapy. I want them to get a therapist if they don't have one. And if they have one, start using them, start being honest, start telling the truth. Um, so back to the question of you know, what is the changing of behaviors, um, I center it around three very simple things that I learned years ago um, doing adolescent care. Honesty in all aspects, open-mindedness, and willingness. Those three things. If, if, and and I'll, ask, I'll ask a family member, are you being honest with me right now? Are you open-minded to different solutions? Are you willing to accept feedback and coaching around things that are uncomfortable to do? And do them even if they're uncomfortable. Because um, the, the, the litmus test for uh, the behaviors that they need to change are the ones that are the most uncomfortable to look yeah. at, right? Yeah. So if you're uncomfortable, we're probably getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so go get your therapist. Um, it's not uncommon for the primary enabler to seek more intensive care, maybe an outpatient program or an inpatient program. Or uh, because of COVID, we've opened up a whole realm of services that you can get without even leaving your, your bedroom. You can just open up your laptop and you can do workshops now. Um, there's a couple programs that have done um, five-day intensives around family dynamics, codependency, and trauma, and they're doing them online now. So um, the objectionable issues that families usually have is, well, I can't afford it, I can't leave, I can't leave work. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, I got a solution for that. You can do it <laughs> at night, and it's only going to cost you like 500 bucks. Um, so... Uh, so boiling it down to the really simple things is um, enablers usually are providing them a place to stay, money. You know what? I got to I got to dial backwards for a second. I don't like the word enabler. It's unfortunately part of our lexicon. Mm -hmm. It's and I frequently common. catch myself using it. Sure. Um, and I'm not one of those people that likes to coddle dysfunction by changing the words to be less com uncomfortable. Sure. Um, but I think it really is very daunting. So initially with families, I don't get into the whole the, the enabling word. Is I try to avoid it because it's a hot button issue for them unless they bring it up. What I do talk about is your parenting style, and, and we're talking about the parent-child dynamic right now rather than the spouse or, or child-parent dynamic. Um, the parenting skills you're currently using with your 30-year-old is appropriate for a nine-year-old. Because that's where they're at. Right. That's all new and to people that are just entering. They usually say, they behave that way, so I have to respond this way. It's and a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. So I'm like, no, actually, the more you treat them like they're nine, they're going to act like they're nine. Mm -hmm. So when's the best time to plant a tree? Not to mention they spend most of the time getting fucked up instead of growing through hard right. times. Right, right. So I say, what's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. Well, what's the second best time? Right, right now. now. So <laughs> let's plant a tree, and that tree is going to be an adult tomorrow. Not, it's, it, we're, not gra we're not gradiating into adulthood. We're flicking a switch because um, we don't grow without there being pain, discomfort. I, I, think, I think physical fitness and spiritual fitness are very akin to each other. I like the 
I like the alignment of the, those two in parallel. And I ask guys, you know what I like about resistance training? It's hard. Mm. It's resistance training. Mm -hmm. I'm fighting against something. When, I, when you fight against things, you get stronger. When you, when you fight resistance, you get stronger. It, it's, these things aren't easy. If they were, everybody would do them. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> Drugs and alcohol are not bad. Drugs and alcohol inherently are not bad. They're fucking awesome. Yeah. That's part of the problem. They feed into this, this, this ability for me to just stick my head in the sand permanently. Mm -hmm. And then you start stacking on all the things that I don't do and all the gaps left in life. God forbid you start stacking on some trauma. And yeah, there, no way I'm gonna get sober. I even, yeah, I even attempt it. And then like, I'm like a, like a wild animal with my food. It's like, what the, right. what the fuck are you threatening me for? Right. Um, you know, what you just said about resistance training is really interesting um, because um, because of that, the way our brains eventually devolve into that binary pleasure-seeking, pain-avoiding uh, um, is we don't have much resilience. No. Unless it's something to do with getting high mm -hmm. or drunk. Um, in that respect, we act like a cockroach. Just not, we just keep going. Oh, no yeah. Why. Oh, yeah. Against I, all odds. I think it was uh, Sandy Beach that used to say, the old speaker from California, he yeah, would yeah. say, put a six-pack of beer on the top of the mountain on Catalina Island and tell a drunk in, you know, in withdrawals it's over there. They'll figure out a way to get over there. If it has to swim, you'll swim. Yeah. You'll climb up to the top. Um, we've got... amazing resilience um, unfortunately our motivators are pretty messed up um, so how do you, here's a, I'm gonna flip the interview okay. how do you get a bunch of addicts to go do resistance training <laughs> um, <laughs> how does that happen are you get I mean there's got to be some guys like I'll, I'll 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 do cardio but I'm not doing resistance training I'm not to be fair, um, not 100% of our clients do 100% of the resistance training 100% of the time. Okay. So to be fair, we're not uh, we're not beating people with canes over here. Lift, damn you! Uh, but there's a big push. We on the medical side, we make sure they're in fit enough right. condition to exercise. Right. Uh, and we work with a trainer, a certified personal trainer. Mm -hmm. So he he and the doc work hand in hand, make sure that the person is. Like, we're not going to kill a guy by having him lift weights. And sure. as long as that's the case, then, yeah, you're going to fucking lift weights today. You're going to be, you're going to do some things that are uncomfortable. That, things like yoga and weight training, all you have to do is run a Google search and you will see the l never ending list of benefits, both psychologically right. and physically. Right. So I won't bore you with why right. yoga and weight training is good for you. <clears throat> What's amazing what I think about it is really this thing you can do emotionally with because you get yoga and I'm gonna stand up here for this weird thing but yoga is a good example mm -hmm. you get a guy who's maybe never done yoga or maybe once or something with his girlfriend or something but he's not into it mm -hmm. he's uncomfortable he's detoxing off fentanyl mm -hmm. so he's very uncomfortable he just got done with you right so now right. He's, so he's been beat up on every front now he's in with a bunch of people he doesn't know and uh, now he's in our yoga studio and he's doing this. He's trying to hold a tree pose. <laughs> and he's going, this is so fucking stupid. I can't believe I'm here. I should just fucking leave. I should just fucking right. leave. I can't believe this is, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe right. fucking Billy and I could just fucking leave. I should just fucking go right now. Right. Next thing you know, an hour goes by and he in, internally he goes, ah, oh, I survived. Right. I just survived an uncomfortable hour. I don't really know if I feel any better for that, but I don't feel any worse. Yeah. And what, what he's done by the, by the time he's completed 24 hours with us, which more or less is kind of like that mm -hmm. all fucking day long, mm -hmm. he's starting to, to string together a succession of wins. Mm -hmm. And by wins, I mean sitting through, leaning into, and in, in, in optimal cases, finding resolution and healing from mm -hmm. uncomfortable experiences one after another mm -hmm. until those uncomfortable experiences become regular. So by the time you get out of here, most guys are like, I like yoga and weight training. <laughs> it's good. It's good um, for you. They like to meditate. You know, they like to go to meetings. They like to. And and I imagine though that because you're not you're not sending them to the gym by themselves, they're doing this as a group. 
And because of COVID, we're doing it here. So we're literally doing it here. The community is built not just about being honest, but also pushing past our physical limits every day. Yep, five days a week. So, so I've got this kid. We're planning this intervention. I'm not joking, and um, and it's a really tough kid because um, mom's anxiety is through the roof. Mom moved from another state sure. to Arizona to be near him simply because if something went wrong, her journey from her house to his place was shorter, even though he never calls her except to get money. And she, yeah. he, won't, he won't show up for the money. Just PayPal it to me. I'm fine. And um, he doesn't have a bond with his family except mom and mom's not trustworthy around the enabling um, so in family systems theory we've got the alcoholic and the co-alcoholic and you've got the hero and the scapegoat and the lost child and, and, the, and the mascot you got all these roles going on well in in a family of of say four this is a family of four and they're a blended family on top of it and the the firstborn, who's part of the step family, is also a highly special needs guy who has pushed through all of his discomfort to be a successful human being. Rad. It, totally rad. Fucking rock star. But you've got this kid who can't stop drinking and playing video games all day long. And he's not bonded. So dad has been the hero this kid's whole life. And mom's been the amazing nurturer his whole life. And his stepbrother has been this overcomer his whole life. Where's he at? Totally lost. Totally isolated. He's more connected to people on Halo mm -hmm. or whatever. Call of Duty, actually, I think yeah. it was. His game du jour is. Then he has to his own family. And Dad's saying, so how do we intervene on this guy? And there's attachment, different attachment approaches that you can make but it's a very different intervention. It takes longer. It's not a one night stand. It's, it's, it's very intensive and it takes a lot of maneuvering and a lot of trust with the family. It usually takes two or three meetings to get it culminated. It's a relationship building type thing. Um, I'm, the point I'm getting to is this, is you've got a kid who's got no attachments to anyone except for the controller in his hand and the tequila bottle on the counter how does he do in a program like this because I'm thinking what you're describing because the reason why I said it is this dad literally said this kid has zero wins mm -hmm. in his column it'd be exactly the way you described treatment you're gonna walk in you're gonna go this isn't for me yeah and in four or five days you're gonna be like I'm home mm. that's how it is is there therapeutic uh, uh, call of duty <laughs> no no um no, the therapy is to get away from video games for a while. And it's not that video games are inherently bad, but they're one more way to escape, stick my head in the sand, yeah. not grow, not be challenged. Yeah. Dude, let me ask you this. Mm. So you've been sober 31 years. Yeah, July 17th was my 31st anniversary. So you were young when you got sober, because you don't look that old to be sober that long. No, I'm 49. Um, uh, so I have an interesting story. My dad was um, a minister growing up, and... Um, That's an interesting family dynamic to begin with. Sure. Um, we're also a blended family. My half-brother and sister from my mom's first marriage um, were uh, considerably older. And I was always very, I'm, I'm definitely a mama's boy. I was pretty tight with my mom. I was always at my mom's heels. Um, but I aspired to be like my dad. And the way that I pictured my dad growing up, funny, charismatic he could connect to strangers in ways that it was a gift the guy had a gift to connect with absolute strangers and he wasn't a salesman the guy had never sold a thing in his life um, he was a he was a knuckle busting monkey wrench guy he was a mechanic um, his whole life and got into being a preacher 
and discovered that he was exceptional at it, except for the whole part where you have to live this disciplined life. <laughs> um, he, he missed that part. And um, so I had this picture of who he was, and I wanted to be like that. So my goal was to be a minister and take over his church someday and you know, go on to, into that. And um, the, that was the fantasy version of the family and the dynamics that were going to work out. Um, the reality of it was, was I was, earliest I can tell was nine years old when I first started to think about not being on the planet anymore. Um, my first thought of suicide was in my closet, covered with a basket of dirty clothes and stuffed animals at nine years old, and sitting in there for most of the day and no one noticing that I wasn't around, and feeling like, I don't matter, I don't exist, why am I alive? That was my first, that's the first cogent memory that I have. It's pretty gnarly, deep, and dark thought for a nine-year-old. For a nine-year-old. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty heavy, bro. So, um, the, uh, and of course that memory gets stuffed. And then in public, I was just like my dad. I was outgoing, energetic, talk to anybody, funny, silly, whatever. Um, extroverted outgoing intelligent enough to get by in a in whatever I needed to do and um, aspiring to be the quintessential preacher's kid because I'll tell you what you get a license to do a lot of stuff when you're a preacher's kid right you get along you get away with stuff even though I wasn't trying to get away with stuff um, I learned very early on that I I could do no wrong somebody's going to cover for me if I did something bad. And it didn't have to be outside, you know, my family covering for I had people outside in the community covering for me. They weren't calling my mom and dad and saying, hey, guess what I saw Billy doing? Where'd you grow up here? Um, born in Flagstaff. Um, my dad took a job up in uh, north central California near um, a town, Modesto. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, that's where he started his first church. And then um, somewhere around seven, um, he got a job uh, running a church in Blythe, California. Um, and we moved from beautiful, green, you know, temperate, central California to hell. Blythe. To Blythe. <laughs> and uh, I never forgave him for that. Uh, even though I love the heat and I'm total desert rat, um, it was um, my first experience of being taken away from things that were super familiar and safe and taken somewhere where I didn't feel familiar or ever feel safe. Um, so uh, an attachment was really hard for me. Um, I was very attached to my little friends. At seven years old, I still can remember most of their names and the things that we did. Well, shit, yeah. Right? And then somewhere after seven, things get really choppy and really weird, and my friends rotate year after year after year after year. You know, the close, the tribe that you hang out with. Yeah. That changed a lot. Um, but I'm in Blythe, and... Uh, uh, the time frame is still kind of foggy, but it, sometimes I'm thinking it's as early as 11 or as late as 13, so I just peg it down to around 12 years old is when a neighborhood kid that was my, my buddy's older brother um, was a loner, and we are literally at the bus stop, and he asked if I wanted to get high after school, and I said yes. Without that, like Earl eye. Hightower, I absolutely do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whatever he said, <laughs> um, I didn't bat an eye. Didn't think about saying no, and the entire day, all I did was think about it. 
until we got home and I'm like dude are we doing that he's like oh yeah and um, as you were saying earlier you know drugs are amazing and it it was the first time uh, feeling okay feeling normal anxiety gone depression gone uh, at peace happy um, it turned this off yeah so uh, that's where the ball got rolling. Um, fast forward through just about every drug on the planet. Sure, sure. Um, where'd, you, where'd you get sober? So my three three guys one the summer before our uh, senior year. Three of the guys that I ran with, they were kind of. They weren't my best friends. I often call them that, but they became very good friends, but they weren't best friends at the time. Um, they were just guys that I either sold drugs with or did drugs with or did drink with. Um, they all go to rehab, and they come back, and they look amazing. They And their families are, you know, happy, and they're happy, and they're driving cars and having nice clothes, and everything looks pristine and perfect. And I wanted something that they had, and... Um, a few months into our senior year of high school, they do an intervention on me. Fuck yeah. Um, and it was uh, it was the idea of my buddy Sean. Um, it was Sean, Ken, and Mike. And Sean's like, let's do an intervention. So there was this guy in our hometown named Rudolfo. Um, big, huge Mexican guy with a Mexican afro. Always wore plaid, just like this, actually. And... Um, he was your token uh, drug and alcohol counselor for all the adolescents, all of them in town. So if you ever got arrested, you had to go to Rodolfo's office, <laughs> and you had to do the you know weekly meetings and IOP and all the check off the boxes. And that's, we'd all been through his office at least once because we'd all been arrested at least once. So Rodolfo was a known entity, never frightening, never scary always welcoming his tagline was so i heard you've been going through some changes man <laughs> and it's good I like he would open you up you know and you get to talking so they got him to host this intervention and um without getting too far into the details because i'll get into minutiae if you let me <laughs> um i say no while saying yes at the same time i'm curious about what they're offering I'm in contemplation. Sober curious. I'm a lot of sober curious people out there. Yeah. I was very curious um, because they appeared happy and um, I hadn't been, the, the drugs hadn't kept me happy. We were just surviving at this point, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's a lot of other certain situations that came into play um, where. Uh, I started going to Narcotics Anonymous meetings and there was a lady named Diane uh, Haywood and her husband Bill Haywood. Uh, both are passed away now. But they were big time people in Narcotics Anonymous and they moved to my town. So they were hosting meetings at their house and they were sponsoring everyone. And they had, um, Bill's story was in the back of the basic text. He was a big deal. And uh, and Diane was crazy intuitive. She's a short, little, red-headed Irish lady from Boston. Loud, obnoxious, told the truth, said the word fuck a lot. I like her already. Oh, she, was a, she was adorable. Um, I hated her because I was keeping secrets. Yeah. And she was reading my mail right. from across the room. And, um, but her... Her shares, each time she would open her mouth, she went through a first step every single time. She would tell her story about getting clean and keeping her mouth shut and not saying a word her first year and doing what she was told and being humble. And she was just, she just, that was, that was her shtick. I just remember her saying that, that same thing. Now she would get into other stuff, but she would always start off every share with that thing. And one day she was like, you know, every time I say that, I'm talking to you. You need to get busy with your sponsor. And uh, at a meeting at her and Bill's house, it was a step study. 
and it's on the four step and it's my turn to share because we're going around in a circle and Diane just politely very gently and politely says Billy how about you just take the cotton out of your ears and stuff it in your mouth because you've never done a four step and I got my feelings hurt um, so of course I never went back to another meeting so sober curious became I'm going to show you guys that I don't need you. I'm, I've been around the 12-step recovery world long enough to have heard people say that they've heard that phrase or they knew someone that used the phrase, but I'm young it, enough that I've never actually heard anybody say it in Somebody actually about. said it to me. That's amazing. Nobody's ever said that to me. And um, People are always like, they used to tell me. And I'm like, oh, cool. I hope nobody tells me Diane that. Diane actually said nobody it. Has. And, um, and later she made amends because she knew she hurt my feelings and that was not her intention at all. Um, we met up many, many years later, and she remembered the moment. Um, it was right after her husband died, Bill died. And, um, um, but that's a whole another story. So, the, uh, so, you know, I was going about, and I wasn't really clean and sober at the time. Um, I was drinking. I was using every kind of over-the-counter something. Sure. You know, I just to wasn't. Me, I me. wasn't going to see Chewy anymore. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's that's I, that's how I was cool with it. 100% identify. For many years, to me, sobriety was represented by marijuana and malt liquor only. Mm. <laughs> right. Uh, the intervention worked because it got me to really thinking about things. Did I go to treatment? No. Did I start exposing myself to twelve-step recovery? Yes. I went to a meeting every week, sometimes a couple times a week, and they were very safe because they were in a in the back room of an old bank, and it was always candlelight. Every meeting in town was candlelight. It's pretty dope. It was really weird. I loved it. I like candlelight meetings. I, I like fire. Been, I, I could stare at that shit all day. <laughs> so um, the uh, uh, of course I you know. I don't last very long trying to prove everybody wrong um, that I don't have a problem with alcohol. I have a problem with all that other stuff. Oh, you're one of those. Um, well, I'm 18. Yeah. I don't want to lose the right to drink on my 21st birthday. That's young. I, I don't want to lose drinking through college. I don't, want, I don't want to lose the right to drink, period. So if I admit I'm fucked. And I didn't want to be fucked. Um, I love when people have five sobriety dates. Right. One for pills, one for alcohol, yeah. one for... That, that's an heroin. interesting journey. <laughs> and I, I, I've never been that way. No. I've never been that way. Um, in fact, in my drinking binge leading up to me going to treatment, if I was around other people and drunk, I was trying to get them to get me high. Um, Luckily, that never happened, but I was trying. And there's a lot of dynamics there because when you start going to NA meetings in my hometown, everybody calls you a narc. <laughs> so nobody was willing to give me anything. Don't fucking say shit to Billy. He's been exactly. He's been he's been narcs. to meetings, right? So, um, but uh, my bottom was. Um, A succession of nights of blackout drinking, and each night, um, basically, the I couldn't shut the lunatic off. I had enough of Diane Haywood's voice in my head and her husband Bill in my head to really mess with my drinking, and because she basically outlined what it what it was, you know, cravings inability to consistently abstain and continue drinking despite consequences. She just nailed that on me over and over and over and over. And I knew it. I mean, every night it was a convincing thing. And there were some nights where I, I didn't drink, but the two I planned on drinking. Um, and then uh, July 16th, um, after several successions of nights of just, it, it was really, really bad. Um, uh, and this was something that I didn't remember for many years, but um, I'd come to this realization that, you remember the movie uh, Taxi Driver? Yeah. Where you stand in front of the mirror 
you talking to me? And he's playing that out. I actually did that um, with the shotgun that I grew up. My dad gave me a shotgun when I was 10. That's a great gift. Um, fantastic. I'd go dove hunting before school. It was not uncommon. Um, and um, so during this period of time, my world's crumbling. Is this in Blythe? This is in Blythe. Blythe. My world ten, is crumbling. Ten-year-old ten year old Billy wandering around at 7 o'clock in the morning with a shotgun. Well, I didn't get to go out at 10. <laughs> at 10, I got my license. Um, at 12, 13, 14, my dad and I, I was on the front of the car. I was on the hood of the car shooting, shooting doves as we're driving down riverbank uh, dirt roads um, some of my best memories were he and I sitting in a blind waiting for doves to come over the brush line the uh, I hated dove by the way I just like <laughs> killing them um, like bonding with your dad it was probably. bonding right it's, it's dude shit you got guns so, and stuff it, you know we get to blow stuff up and rip heads off things it's fantastic um I, I, uh, I was doing everything I could that week to control the drinking that Diane was proving to me that I couldn't, the Diane in my head. And um, I had this existential moment, and I've only heard one other person ever describe this from the podium as a guy out in Palm Desert who's three times my age. And, um, with all the concentrated effort I had in my head to not continue to go back to the fridge and get more beer, I kept physically getting up off my chair and going to get more beer. I could not stop my body from going to get more beer. Um, and that was very surreal. Um, how come I can't stop my body from going to get more beer? So. I'm going to blow my brains out because the drinking is not working. The lunatic's still going on. Um, the guy that the guy one of the one of the three guys that brought meetings into Durango Jail when I heard the message. Yeah. He said I thought it was my bike. <laughs> he's like I would not. He's like I'm not going to smoke crack today. And I would get on the bicycle and instead of home the bike would just take me to take the crack me house. right to the crack house. Right. <laughs> Fucking bike. <laughs> That's funny. So um, I'm going to blow my brains out. Like, it's not working. I can't shut the lunatic off. I feel guilty for everything that's ever happened in the entire world. I mean, I just, I'm just an absolute train wreck. And um, I wake up the next morning. And, and I'm, I'm processing this like I'm doing this. And I, and I distinctly remember Benny Hill on TV and that stupid song. Da, 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 Do you ever watch Benny Hill? You have no idea what I'm talking about. So Benny Hill Benny was Hill a very was, sexually inappropriate comedian that was on HBO way back in the day. And he had this stupid intro song. And uh, the song used to trigger the hell out of me for years. Um, I follow, I pass out, I go to sleep. And I go from sweating, panting, my heart rate's up, I got a gun in my mouth. I got the hammer back. I got my thumb in the trigger guard. I know what it's tasting like in the top of my, you know, on my tongue. I know what the front sight feels like against the roof of my mouth. I'm like going through all of this. And I wake up the next morning. Really weird. Um, and I hadn't had enough drink to drink to really pass out. Um, and I woke up sitting in my chair in my tidy whities um, with this cocked loaded shotgun in my lap and terrified first time terrified I threw on some clothes jumped in the car drove down to Rodolfo's office I'm like and he was off that day it was a Monday and uh, this old uh, this old gay John who drove a, a Pontiac Fiero and he had a license plate Alky. I'll never forget this guy. A-L-K-Y. Um, and he'd been sober in 12 steps for years. And I walked in and I said, where's Rodolfo? He's off. I said, great. Uh, I don't know you. You don't know me. I need to get to treatment as soon as possible. Now, that's, that's five days later I was walking into Lost Heads Ranch in Desert Hot Springs, California. And uh, um and there's a whole series of like really weird events that led up to my admission 
that happened throughout my treatment experience um, that without those experiences being chained together and me realizing God was helping me from the day before I take you know the day I take my last drink like I I know that he just like you know Spock pinch go to sleep you're not going to make it through tonight if you don't go to sleep right now um, to certain things that happened um, and I won't get into it because it'll make a very long podcast <laughs> um, I walked into treatment having no money no understanding of how treatment's paid for uh, I had great insurance but the recovery house they sent me to was a mom and pop 12 step immersion no medical no insurance and by the time they figured out that I hadn't paid for my stay I'd already bonded with everybody I was on day five I went from fuck you to yes and they're like have you guys seen this I didn't even <laughs> know there's other people like me and they right I'm home <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, and 30% of the guys are all convicts, you know, um, and uh, I'm hanging out with people I've never hung out with in my lifetime, and I'm loving these people, um, and I'm feeling good, and they're like, dude, if, if you don't, how are you paying for this? They ended up scholarshipping me. So good. Yeah. Um, if certain questions had been answered, I would have never even made it there. I would have never. I was started my journey in some, you know, spin drive. <coughs> and uh, I have a tough question for you. Yeah, but it's one that's one that I think is important. When, when what happened to you happened, and I don't mean externally, because the stuff that happened externally, give or take, is the same stuff that happens externally to you alcoholics and drug addicts all over the world sure. who have the same experience. Like, alcoholics and drug addicts, they drink and use until they die. Right. Except when they don't. Yeah. And they get sober, and they, they don't just stop drinking. The, the stories like yours, like, you don't, you didn't just stop drinking when you were 18 and go on to live a, a normal life without alcohol. You've gone on to lead, lead an extraordinary life. Right, you've been picking up a breadcrumb trail unraveling the mystery for a long time. For a long time, sure. I, I get where you're going, yeah. So what, so, and I like that you're not shy about using the word God, so what the fuck happens inside of a person where they go from like, I am so dysfunctional, I can't even, I'm not good for myself or anyone around me, yeah. to becoming this like person who's like hot on the spiritual trail. What, what is that? And it seems to work on How much time do we have? <laughs> a series of, of events that was happening along with Ken and Mike and Sean intervening on me. There was Dr. Ken Richardson and Mr. Ken Scott. They ran the counseling center at my high school. They saw some quality in me that I couldn't see. They had seen me a lot in that office because the numerous times I've been arrested and thrown out of school, eventually when you get back into school, you got to go to the counseling center a lot. Eventually I got a job in there. And um, Ken Scott in particular took a liking to me and he decided that he was going to expose me to the counseling field. And he got me some training in peer counseling. This is 1988. Um, What's your sporting date? 88? Not 89. Yeah, okay. So he gets me training. Um, and so all these different things happen. And here I am. My life is a mess. And this double, this double life I'm leading over here, now I'm actually having peer counseling sessions with other students in the counseling center. And I'm loving it. I'm digging it. Um, it's all codependent crap, but I'm connecting with people in ways mm -hmm. that I'd never had. Um, and so I hit bottom, and I feel like a huge disappointment. I go see, you know, I go have dinner with, with Mr. Scott, and he was so proud of me. He, he, he was so happy. I'm like, you're finally getting the help. You're going to change lives, you know. And... Um, I got a bug when I worked with those two guys, Dr. Stedman and Mr. Scott. Um, 
and some of those skills that they trained me i went on a five-day training for this peer counseling gig um we still use those in school now they're like very simple reflective listening and you know all those um uh, conversation skills uh i'm sitting weird with a NLP woman he stuff hmm? weird nlp stuff yes yes um i'm sitting on the front step of the women's dorm at lost heads Ran recovery ranch and lost heads it was at the time it was called lost heads because it was a fun it, at one time it was a functioning cattle ranch and they always lost cattle heads of cattle Heads gotcha. of cattle. It was also a brothel at one time, which it's perfect. makes it perfect. More character. Um, and I and Carol is in her forties. I'm eighteen, and Carol's devastated. She got some bad news, and I walk Carol through it. And she turns to me and she goes, "You're fucking eighteen, and you just walked me through something I've never been able to do." God's got something in store for you. And that was that bing. Because I, I was asking myself the question, walking into rehab, like the next person closest to my age was 26. 18-year-olds didn't go to big grown-up rehab right. back then. Not very often. Um, I was 26 when I got sober, and I was one of the youngest around in my yeah. little circle 16 um, years ago. And I'm like, Why? Why did I get to be so fucked up so young? You know, what, what, it, like, this sucks, but I'm glad I got a solution. And, um, and I'm really hungry for some sort of purpose because I have no, no measurable skills. I have nothing, nothing moving forward in life. I, I have no idea. I know how to flip burgers and fill up gas tanks. That's my skill set or mow grass. Um, but Carol saying that really resonated with me in a way that, um, maybe all of these things falling into place haven't been by an accident. And I was trying my best to be an atheist at the time, by the way. <laughs> my one requirement for it's treatment. Like to yeah. Uh, my one requirement when I told John to get me treatment is don't send me to a Christian program. I can't go to faith-based program. That was my only objection. I don't Fair care enough. where you send me, just as long as they're not talking about Jesus, I'm good. And... Um, uh, I caught this bug and fast forward I get out of treatment and I'm running into my executive director at meetings because why because I'm going to meetings where he lives so I can run into him and I'm bugging him for a job I'm bugging him for a job bugging him for a job and finally one day another series of events where they needed to hire somebody right away to cover the overnight shift and I said I'll do it you like me pick me yeah I'll do it I can stay awake I'm a great night owl total lies could not stay awake to save my life um and that got me in the door so that's always been my understanding of like i let you get this miserable this fast because i've got a job for you so i spent my first 10 years and so after working at the rehab i got sober at i came out to california or arizona and uh i worked in adolescent care for about 11 years straight um and then went from there, that's how I ended up at Gatehouse, working with the 17 to 27 year olds. Um, Cause I've got all, I got all the psychiatric background and all this adolescent work under my belt and all the safety stuff and all this family stuff. I had a great clinical director that got me involved in doing family work when I was 21 and doing all this family training all, this, all these years. And Gatehouse, it's not around anymore. <sighs> Unfortunately not. Um, it had a, a lot of, managerial shortcomings that caused it to close but dynamically one of the most amazing programs I've ever seen heard of or, or worked at and that's where you got to know both Dave Johnson and Matt Brown yeah Dave both, hired me who both speak very highly of you oh um, Dave hired me in fact um, I had uh, taken a break from the field I was really burnt out in adolescent care and um, a buddy of mine was like dude I'm gonna go sling cable for Cox, why don't you come with me? I was so cooked, I was so burnt. I said, cool, let's go do that. So I do that for about six months and I'm like, 
I am not cut out for this. Climbing around in attics, and I fell through some lady's garage ceiling. <laughs> and uh, and I'm so ADD, like I'm dropping tools, I'm doing, I'm just, I'm not cut out for the work. So, um, I do a Google search for um, young adult programs, and I come across Gatehouse. I'm like, what the hell is Gatehouse? I've been around here for a while. I've never heard of Gatehouse. All these other programs on the list I've heard of. I, I don't want to work at any of them what's this? And I go to their website and I'm like, hey honey, I just found the next place I'm going to go work. What year was this? It was the year my daughter was born, so it was 2004. It's the year I got sober. 2004. And um, so uh, I go out for a full day uh, interview a whole day show up at 8 plan to be here all day and I did it they said come back tomorrow did it again and I thought I made it through the gauntlet and uh, week after week nothing 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 so I was bugging Dave I'm going dude I'd like to have a job before they find a medical cure for addiction. Can you can what, what's going on here? And finally, it's like I have stubborn owners. They don't like hiring people from the outside. In fact, I'm the first guy they ever hired that wasn't already connected to the owners or the people that run it. You're the only stranger we've ever considered, and it's taking time because we don't have the budget to pay you. We need you. We just don't have the money yet. I think it was nine months later when I finally got the job. <laughs> And uh, they call me out for another interview, and it's with Matt Brown, and he takes me down to Carolina's in, in, in the, on the main stretch there, and, and, and he's like, uh, if you haven't figured out, I'm not interviewing you. I'm training you. You're taking over my job, like, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it was at Gatehouse. Like, here's your, here's your clients. Take care of them. And it was, it was hit the ground running. And because... Uh, Matt was running the family communications department, and Gatehouse's way of constantly keeping a whole bunch of 17 to 28-year-old kids from running down the street was to have a department, which was one person, in constant contact with the family doing many interventions every time you make the phone call. <coughs> every call was an intervention. Every call was laying a foundation for long-term stay. Every call was confronting enabling. Every call was confronting coddling. Every one of them. And then figuring out how to You're tell speaking them. Speaking my language right, right. Confronting enabling, confronting coddling. It, it, was, <laughs> it was a great job, and, um, and I had to do it for. That's gladiator training for intervention work. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and it was a gatehouse that we all, I mean, the, the, the CEO was a lunatic, a wonderful guy with lots and lots of problems, but he was a lunatic. And he'd say, I got a kid whose family won't stop enabling. I'm going to send you over here to do an intervention. And off we went. No training, no idea what we're doing. Don't fuck it up. And turn around and bring the guy back to, for treatment, you know? <laughs> and that's how we got, oh. Um, most of the guys that were working in the department, they had all had an intervention, so they kind of had an idea of what they were doing. And I was flying blind. I had no idea. Um, I didn't do a lot of those then, but I did a few of them, and, and, and I definitely caught the bug. Um, so, but that was my favorite job. I, I, the family work and all the training I'd gotten, adolescent work, all fit in extremely well in the gatehouse matrix. And um, uh, there's a lot of alumni and former staff, and we have a Facebook page, and every once in a while somebody will say something or post an old photo, and we just kind of like collectively grieve its, its demise. Oh, wow. That's how I feel um, about the solution. Right. The old solution. Yeah. All right. Here's a question I ask most guests. Hmm. What do drug addicts look like? Um, In your mind, before you got into recovery, <sighs> what do drug addicts look like? That's interesting. Um, in my hometown, they drove lowriders. They lived on the west side of town, and a little. And a, so there was 
our town was very segregated to to a degree, and even though it was like largely Latino during during, during the heart blight, during during the harvest time, I think it's still like everything. Everything was you know very melting pot, but. <laughs> The west side was where the Latinos lived, and the south side was where the, the African Americans lived, and then the white folks lived on the north side, and, and all the hillbillies were scattered on the east side, and that's where I lived. And um, so if you had asked me back then what does a drug addict look like, I would say my drug dealer. His name, he was the quintessential Mexican dope dealing, driving a low rider, wife beater, you know, Dickie Sagan, named Primo. Fucking love that guy. <laughs> he I was great. Love that guy. He was great. I would drink forties with that guy. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I would have thought of. Um, the, but contrast that with my neighbor across the street, who was living at home with his elderly parents, who had a quadriplegic dad that needed taken care of, and I knew he was a drug addict. But he wasn't like those other folks. Like he worked, he made money, he functioned. He changed dichotomy. He smoked weed every day. He liked to do tweak. He liked to do cocaine. He liked to, t- to pop. Like he was a little bit of everything. And but he had no wife beater, nor a lowrider. No, he drove a nice he truck. He, you know, and um, and he kept things really under the under the. Uh, under wraps, so a lot of folks didn't know. Everybody knew he was a pot smoker, but nobody knew that he was he was in trouble. He was my best friend. I went to work for him. He paid me in drugs. It was a great arrangement. It's perfect. Perfect arrangement. Um, you know, what kind of moral aptitude gives a 12-year-old a job and pays him with dope? I don't know what that says about a guy, but that's what we do as addicts. Um, I think about, there's this conversation that often happens when I'm meeting with a family, and it's the parents intervening on the kid, right? And they start to talk about the kid's friends. Oh, God. You know what I'm saying, right? I know exactly where you're His going. His druggy friends. Mm-hmm. It's like the government calling our enemies insurgents. Right. It dehumanizes, it stigmatizes, yeah. it separates. They're yeah. not human. Not human. In fact, it's probably it's their fault. Friends. It's probably is their probably fault. their fault. Fuckers. Well, I just go get them. And and I'll say to a family, um, you know, me <laughs> and your kid are those guys. Right. That's good. We are those guys. The guy that you just hired to get your kid out. That's that's. On the podcast page where this will be posted, it says you look like a drug addict. Right. And then I give a little caption underneath. Drug addicts look like everybody. That's awesome. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you mentioned er, uh, last week the idea of of stigma. Um, e- I'm only 49, but I've been around long enough to know what stigma really was like. And it still was nowhere near what it used to be like when 12 Steps started. Right. Well, I mean, if you thing. had a watch, you you weren't a prospect, right? Um, so uh, the stigma in the you know late eighties, where uh, the term recovering addict or recovering alcoholic really started to emerge, um, you didn't tell your grandparents. You only, t- you know, and if the f- nuclear family knew, obviously, they were okay. But you can't tell anybody else. No, a lot of shame. You shame we're, our family. Where, 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 what, what happened to Billy? He moved. He had his appendix out. He moved. He left town. He went to the military. He, 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 he got a great <laughs> job out of town. He moved. Fucking anything <laughs> but the truth. That's yeah. <laughs> um, uh. I was raised by the silent generation of adopted my grandparents. They grew up during the Depression. Mm. So we talked about zero. <laughs> I'm very familiar with that lifestyle. Wow. <laughs> so silence was They're not so the golden. Generation. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I have to think about it. You know, I thought about the idea of stigma, and, and I, there's some people that I follow on social media, and they're big in the campaign against stigma. Mm hmm. 
Um, and I, I, I see the point in some areas where, like, if I have someone who their primary objection to getting help is the name that they may be given to the condition that brought them there, yes. we've got problems. We, 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 have, we have a problem with that dynamic because am I supposed to call this person forever and never mention the A word the entire time? I mean, there's times where I'm doing interventions. That's not the time to confront, right? I'm not here to confront the addict's dysfunction except for the point where it gets them so uncomfortable they, they have to get help. Um, so I'll, I'll avoid the word addict the whole time if I need to. But you know, whatever gets them through the door. Whatever gets them through the door. But at it, some point, we we have to well, say they settle in after after, like you said, once they get in. Yeah. They settle in. They're like, oh, this is fine. Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. I'm an addict. Whatever. Right. They and they get used to it pretty fast. But it does. It keeps people out. It keeps people out thinking that they're different or that they're fucked up or that they're damaged that they're broken, and. It's heartbreaking to me that a single person that struggled with the same problems that you and I have struggled with yeah. doesn't find the incredible, deeply fulfilling, purpose-driven lives that we have found because they're fucking scared what somebody might think. Mm. And fuck that. It breaks my heart. That's why the... It breaks my heart. That's why the, necessary, the necessity of some level of bottom has to occur because you get desperate then the pain has to overwhelm the fear of what other people are going to think mm -hmm. and there's multiple fears but that's one of the that's a big one what sure. are other gonna people gonna think I'll tell you what when I woke up and saw that shotgun I didn't give a fuck who thought anything I walked into I mean I wasn't walking into John's office and said dude I almost blew my brains out let's go to help no I walked in and said I've got a problem and we need to go to rehab they didn't even ask me qualifying questions. They didn't drop a drug test, nothing. There was a look on my face. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go. So I didn't have to worry about any stigmas, and the last thing I was concerned about was whether or not I had to put a new middle name on my shit. I'm <laughs> Billy, I'm an alcoholic, you know? <laughs> um, that, it, it, It was actually the first time. It was it was the it was the word that I used that allowed me to join the first club that I ever really belonged in. Twelve step recovery. Yeah. It was the only place where I could walk in anywhere in the world and say, "I'm Billy. I'm an addict alcoholic, and I don't have to say anything else. I'm at home." And I've been to a lot of meetings in a lot of different states, and a few in Mexico, and. Elsewhere, and even in Spanish, it's fantastic. Um, and that was something I didn't have growing up. As much as it, it, it hurts my family to know that I always felt like I was on the outside looking in, but that's how it was. And that's how it is for most of the folks I'm intervening. Um, a really smart person once said, addiction is an illness of disconnection. You know what we should do? There's a, there's a virus going around. We should all isolate. We should all stay away from each other. <laughs> it is the That's craziest time. Because I think even... even I, I realized I was getting on a Zoom call this morning mm -hmm. with a bunch of colleagues. And I got into that old... Do I really want to do this? I think I'm just going to like come up with an excuse. And I caught myself going, no, you need connection. And you're 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 making excuses to avoid connection. Mm -hmm. You need to show up for this. Yeah. Um. It's where I find comfort and challenge, right? It's where I get accountability. Yeah. I need to have this. It's how we. It's how we survive. I can't stay sober, but we can. And um, that was the enduring message that Diane planted in my head. She constantly called it, this is a we program. Mm -hmm. That's what it says on Karen's office in the door. This is a we program. And that morning, driving to Rodolfo's office, I was utterly convinced that no matter what happened at the end of me getting help, 
I couldn't do it without those people. Totally convinced. At 18, I'm fine. I'm convinced. I, I, I don't understand how that happens because I've been around long enough to watch people just battle that one out to amazing degrees of self-deprivation and, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, self-degradation to avoid the we. Um, there's an old guy that used to go to the Birds of a Feather meeting before he died. He'd, he would always say, we're the lucky ones. Well, man, I appreciate deeply the work that you do both in your personal life and in your profession. You as well, Estel. Um, I don't know how we missed each other for as many years as we did, but I'm glad that we finally did. Me too. Yeah. Uh, and I'm telling you, I want to I wanna sit you down again sometime in the next few months. And right on. Uh, we'll go deeper. Cool. It's great to I'm have in. you. I'm in. I'm in. Thanks, right brother. On, Billy. Thank you.